our heads, and I'm going to read some scripture, and then let's pray together. First, I'm going to read from Psalm 76, verses 11 and 12. The word says, make vows to the Lord your God and fulfill them. Let all the neighboring lands bring gifts to the one to be feared. He breaks the spirit of rulers. He is feared by the kings of the earth. Amen. We're gathered here today to worship the one true God. He is holy and righteous. We are sinners. And our sin separates us from our God. So would you pray a repentant prayer with me? Would you pray for each other and pray for this service? I ask that you lift up your voices and your hearts together. Let us go to him right now in prayer. Let us pray in the name of Jesus. Father in heaven, we humble ourselves before you. We know, Lord, that you are God Almighty. We know, Lord, that you are the creator of the heavens and the earth. You are the one true God and there is no other. And you are holy and righteous. But, Lord, we are sinners. We have rebelled. We have failed you, Lord. And, Lord, we are not worthy. But you have provided a way through your son, Jesus. Jesus, who we believe is the Christ, the Messiah, our Lord, our Savior. And we come to you and we thank you, Lord. Thank you that you sent your Holy Spirit to us to lead us and guide us, to anoint us, Lord. And may we be used by you. Please, Father, oh, hallelujah. Please, Lord, have mercy on us and forgive us of our sins. Cover us with the blood of Jesus. Let us come to you, Lord. Let us give you this time. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be here today. And I thank you, Lord, for every soul that's here. Every soul that's here and every soul that may hear these words and may participate, Lord, wherever they are in the whole wide world. May, Lord, we humble ourselves before you. Please, Lord, hear our words and hear our worship and may it be sincere from our hearts May, Lord, what we do and say be pleasing to you. Forgive us where we have failed you. Give us strength where we are weak. You are our God, and we are your people. We want to please you. We want to come to you. Allow us now, Lord. Allow us to do that. Allow us to put away the world and only give this time to you because you are our God, and we are your people. And it's in your name, Lord Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We're going to sing, Come Thou Almighty King. Come Thou Almighty King, help us find thee to sing. Help us to pray, Father, all glorious, for all victorious, come and reign over us, ancient of days. Come thou in heart and word, gird on thy mighty sword, our prayer again. Come and thy people bless, and till thy word success, spirit of holiness on us descend. Come, holy comforter, thy sacred witness bear. In this glad hour, thou who almighty art, now rule in every heart, and there from us depart, spirit of power. Through the great one and three, eternal praises be, it's evermore. His sovereign majesty, may we in glory see, and to eternity love and adore. Amen. Amen. Now we're going to.
going to lift the Lord's name on high. taking your seats. Please turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 37. We're going to read verses 9 through 17. That's Jeremiah 37, 9 through 17. Sister White is going to read for us in the Korean language. Sister White, please. 아, 오늘 말씀은 에레미야 37장 9절에서 17절입니다. 여호와께서 이와 같이 말씀하시니라 너희는 스스로 속여 말하기를 갈대아이니 반드시 우리를 떠나리라 하지 말라 그들이 떠나지 아니하리라 가령 너희가 너희를 치는 갈대아이니 온 군대를 쳐서 그 중에 부상자만 남긴다 할지라도 그들이 각기 장막에서 일어나 이 성을 불사르리라 갈대아이나 군대가 바로의 군대를 두려워하여 예루살렘에서 떠나매 에레미야가 베냐미 땅에서 백성 가운데 분깃을 받으려고 예루살렘을 떠나 그리로 가려하여 베냐민 문에 이른 즉 하나냐의 손자여 셀레마의 아들인 이리야라 이름하는 문지기의 우두머리가 선지자 엘레미야를 붙잡아 이르되 내가 갈대아인에게 항복하려 하는도다 에레미야가 이르되 거짓이다 나는 갈대아인에게 항복하려 하지 아니하노라 이리야가 듣지 아니하고 에레미야를 잡아 국간들에게 고관들에게 끌어가매 고관들이 노려워하여 에네미야를 때려서 서기관 요나단의 집에 가두었으니 이는 그들이 이 집을 옥으로 삼았음이더라. 에네미야가 뚜껑 씌운 운동이를 웅덩이에 들어가 이제 여러 날 만에 히느기야 왕이 사람을 보내어 그를 이끌어내고 왕궁에서 그에게 비밀이 물어 이르되 여호와께서 받은 말씀이 있느냐 에네미야가 대답하되 있나이다. 또 이르되 왕이 바벨론의 왕의 손에 넘겨지리이다. 아멘. Jeremiah 37 verses 9 through 17. This is what the Lord says. Do not deceive yourselves thinking the Babylonians will surely leave us. They will not. Even if you were to defeat the entire Babylonian army that is attacking you and only wounded men were left in their tents, they would come out and burn this city down. After the Babylonian army had withdrawn from Jerusalem because of Pharaoh's army, Jeremiah started to leave the city to go to the territory of Benjamin to get his share of the property among the people there. But when he reached the Benjamin gate, the captain of the guard, whose name was Arajah, son of Shelemiah, 
the son of Hananiah, arrested him and said, You are deserting to the Babylonians. That's not true, Jeremiah said. I'm not deserting to the Babylonians. But Arijah would not listen to him. Instead, he arrested Jeremiah and brought him to the officials. And they were angry with Jeremiah and had him beaten and imprisoned in the house of Jonathan the secretary, which they had made into a prison. Jeremiah was put into a vaulted cell in a dungeon where he remained a long time. Then King Zedekiah sent for him and had him brought to the palace where he asked him privately, Is there any word from the Lord? Yes, Jeremiah replied, You will be handed over to the king of Babylon. Amen. May the Lord add blessing to the reading of his holy word. Let us pray, please. Our Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for this, your word and this message. And Lord, I thank you for these people who are here to receive it today. And Lord, we know we need your Holy Spirit to help us to see and hear what you have for us today. May your understanding and your wisdom be with us, Lord. Use this message for your glory. May we draw near to you through it, Lord. And may we have your power in our hearts. For it is in your name, Lord Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Hallelujah. God speaks to us. You know, I know for a fact that God Almighty wants to speak to us. After all, he sent his prophets, prophet after prophet after prophet. His word he sent. Today we have the written word. He sent the word that became flesh. Obviously God wants to talk to us. He wants to speak to us. But the problem is this. Do we really want to hear what God has to say to us? That is the question. Remember, he is God Almighty. He is God. He is not the president of the United States or the president of any country. He's not the pope or some other international celebrity. He is God Almighty. He is God, and believe it or not, he wants to speak to us, to us, if we will listen to him. We live in an age, you know, of uh, high technology. I, I, even I have to admit that technology has come a long ways. We, we've become so advanced that we can communicate with people on the other side of the earth almost in real time without almost no delay at all. The delay is so short we might as well be standing five foot from each other. I'm amazed by our technology. And we can communicate in a number of ways. You know, you have regular mail and radio and TV and telephone and cell phones and faxes and email and the Internet. And, and you can get a hold of someone. If you can't get a hold of them, you can leave a message or voicemail or even text. So easy today. We're able to get news from across the world at the touch of a button almost as soon as it happens. New York to L.A., U.S. to Europe, all over the world. We can hear from anybody, from anywhere, anytime. But what we really need to hear is a message from God. And you know what? We don't need high tech for that. We don't need high tech to hear from God. There's no easier access to anybody or anything than God Almighty. Because God is with us, around us, he hears us. It's so easy to talk to God, and yet for some reason it's so hard for us to do it. All we have to do is call on the name of Jesus Christ, and guess what? We're logged in. We don't need a password or a, a name or anything, you know, because he knows us by name. Hallelujah. Because uh, Good thing, because I'd forget my password. I have to write it down someplace. But... I don't need one to speak to God, right? Just call on his name. Uh, God said in Jeremiah 33, 3, Call to me, and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things that you do not know. And God doesn't need Google either or any of the other search engines because he knows. But in this age today of high technology, we still need to ask the same question that Zedekiah asked. 
Jeremiah here in our text in Jeremiah 37, 17. He says, is there any word from the Lord? Is there any word from God? The answer to that question is a definite yes. God is still communicating to us today. It's not a new revelation, though, or a new message, but it's an old one that needs to be repeated over and over and over again. You know why? Because we human beings, we don't take it too well the first time or the second time or the hundredth or one thousandth time, and we forget because of our human nature. God wants to speak to us. But do we really want to hear what God has to say to us? That's the question today. God, believe it or not, He wants to speak to us if we will listen. The Lord, I believe today, is getting His church ready. He wants to speak to the church. But I'm afraid a lot of the church isn't ready and the church isn't listening we have compromised. We, we have let the world in. God wants to speak to us and get us clean and ready for something. You know what that something is? He wants us to get ready for the marriage supper of the Lamb. Hallelujah. Read Revelations. If you don't know Revelations, then you probably have no idea what I'm talking about right now. But he certainly wants to get us ready for that marriage supper to the Lamb. But we really do. We really want to hear <coughs> excuse me, from God. That's the question. Jeremiah was shut in with God. He couldn't be brought at any price, and he, he wept over the sins of God's people. He was ready to lay down his life, really, for the church. He was cast into jail and into a deadly mud pit for speaking the truth. Poor Jeremiah, seems like every other chapter he sowed someplace that he wouldn't want to go. If y'all have not noticed that in the book of Jeremiah, he sowed in cisterns and pits and mud and jail and beaten and hid and laughed at and mocked. Time after time, though, Scripture says that Jeremiah waited in the Lord's presence until the word of the Lord came to him. This phrase appears over 50 times in the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah actually had to wait many times for the word of the Lord to come to him. It wasn't instantaneous. It seems like he had to be put someplace in a prison. He had to be someplace where he's by himself when the word of the Lord would come to him. In those days, there was really no shortage of the true word of God. Throughout history, the Lord has always had his true prophets and his pastors. Even in times of spiritual compromise and decline, there always seemed to be somebody with God's word. Have you not noticed that even when the nation and the people had turned against God, didn't want to hear it, he still had somebody that are speaking on his behalf. And that's the case here with Jeremiah. Time after time, you read the word, and the word of the Lord came to Isaiah, and the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah and Ezekiel. It came to Daniel and Jose and Joel and Amos and Jonah and Micah and Habakkuk and Zephaniah and Haggai and Zechariah and Malachi, time and time again. And guess what? God wants to send his word to us today. Time and time again, the word of God came to people. God's word was always clear warning of full judgment against sin. But it was more than that. Even though God's judgment came, even though these prophets came with the judgment of God and his word, you know what else came with it? Was hope. God always gives us hope. He tells us the truth. And then he gives us hope. Yes, we are sinners, but there is hope. Yes, we have failed God, but there's hope. Jesus is our hope. God's word was full of hope for those who repent. Those whose hearts were not hardened, there was hope. Usually, there were three kinds of responses 
to the word of truth. And you see these same three responses today, even in Christians today, in 2021. Let me give you these three responses. First, we have this one where they don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear. Many people simply do not want to hear what God is saying. The Israelites had no intentions of quitting their sinful ways. Instead, they wanted a soft, soothing word. They wanted to hear good news. Don't tell us any good news. Don't tell us anything that we're doing wrong. Don't tell us that. Just tell us the good part. If we really want to hear what God is saying to us today, we would read his word and try to be at every service, worship service. If you really want to hear from God today, then read his word. Read his Bible every day. Or, and come to service, worship service, every time. But many people say, well, I want to hear from God. What they mean is they don't want to do anything. They just want to hear a big voice. Too much work to read. Too much time, I guess. Listen, if we really want to hear from God, then we wouldn't want to miss a service because guess what? We would be afraid that we might miss what he's saying, right? May the Lord help us to, to never get to the point that we want, don't want to hear what he has to say to us. The prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah 39 through 10, he says, For these are rebellious people, deceitful children, children unwilling to listen to the Lord's instruction. They say to the seers, See no more visions. And to the prophets, give us no more visions of what is right. Tell us pleasant things. Prophesy illusions. Are there children of God today who would actually demand that their pastors give them a decision message? What do you think? Yes, there are. You may not hear them say these words, but you can see their response. And you can see their response when the man of God brings a strong prophetic word. Many of them will leave the church saying, I can't take this kind of preaching anymore. It just unnerves me. Um, I've heard people say, well, I prefer simple Bible teaching on how to, how to cope with my problems. That's what they want to hear. They, they come to church to hear preaching. Somebody telling them, well, what to do if this happens? Or what to do if that happens? They, they're looking for instruction from the pastor, from the preaching. That's what they want. They don't really want to hear God's word. Many so despise any word that exposes their sin that they demand that that type of message be stopped. The reason many don't want to hear from God is because it exposes their sin in their life. Sin that they don't want to quit. Sin that they don't want to get rid of. Sin that they enjoy. These kind of people like to read the promises of God and claim them, but they can't stand thou shalt not. They just want the promises that God gives. They don't want to hear the conditions. Then you have those that are prideful. Others say privately that they want to hear what God is saying, but their pride actually hinders them from hearing what God has to say. King Zedekiah, uh, he, he best uh, illustrates this kind of person. He was a man of great power, influence, and authority. After all, he was the king of Judah, right? His father, Josiah, was a godly man. So we know that Zedekiah, he had a background in holiness. He knew the things of God. His father, after all, was a godly man. 
that when this man inherited the throne, it appears that he had no time for the Lord, that is, until there was a problem or a crisis or something he didn't know what to do or something that he couldn't handle, guess who the first one he called on was? God. Isn't it strange how many of us, we need a crisis in our lives before we want to hear what God is saying to us. Everything is going good, I don't want to hear from God. I'm happy, I don't need to hear from God. Everything, I'm handling everything. Everything's perfect, everything's good. But as soon as there's a problem, something we can't handle, we go crying to God. As long as things seem to be going relatively smooth in our lives, we don't care or have very much time for God. But let something happen, and guess what? We're in church right away, and we're wanting to hear a word from the Lord that will help us. We don't just do it as individuals. We do it as a society. As a nation, we do it. You see, here in our scripture during this time frame, Jerusalem was, was suddenly besieged surrounded by a ruthless Chaldean army. That army was very strong and very powerful. Eventually there was a shortage of bread and water was running really low. In Jeremiah 37, 3, Zedekiah called for the prophet Jeremiah asking him, please pray to the Lord our God on our behalf. That's what he said. He sounded so sincere calling the nation to prayer. But Jeremiah prophesied destruction to the king. About that time, though, word hit the, that the surrounding Chaldeans, that the Pharaoh was coming up from Egypt. He was approaching from the west, and he had a huge army. According to verse 5, that army, they withdrew from Jerusalem. Now, we didn't read that because I thought in the interest of time and you want to look back and read that whole chapter, please be my guest. In fact, I'm hoping that all y'all go home today and you read that whole chapter. But the army, Chaldeans, they, they withdrew from Jerusalem. Now, can you imagine something here? I want you to think about this for a second. Imagine the relief and the cheers on top of Jerusalem's walls as the Israelites saw their enemy running away. Can you imagine how happy they were? Think about this. You're inside this city. You're surrounded by the enemy. They're strong. They're about to destroy you. And all of a sudden, they're running away. You're going to be happy, right? Sure you are. You can hear all the leaders and the judges and the magistrates all saying, our walls are not cast down. Our city is not burning. So much of what old Jeremiah said, all he always talked about was gloom and doom. Jeremiah don't know what he's talking about. That's what they were saying. That's what I'd be saying probably, let's be honest. I believe that they were partying that night. They had the wine was flowing and food was plentiful that night. They threw open the gates and probably announced a whole week of official celebration. I imagine they were thinking the crisis is over let us celebrate. True to human nature, everyone put the crisis out of their minds and they went back to business as usual. That's the way we humans are. We have a crisis and once that crisis is over, it's like we forgot that it happened. King Zedekiah must have been very embarrassed by his call to prayer earlier, thinking, how could I have been so alarmed? How come I was so intimidated by that prophet Jeremiah? How many times have we concluded that because the word from God didn't happen immediately, that the preacher must have missed it? How about that? Have you ever thought about that? Because God's promise didn't happen immediately, it means it's not going to happen. How many times has that happened? The crisis is over. The problem is over. So why worry now? But understand something. Understand that God 
will always fulfill his word. He always will do what he says he will do. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but eventually every word from the Lord God Almighty will be fulfilled. Now, who do you think that night when they were partying that they were making fun of? They were mocking. Who do you think was the bad guy that night? He was ridiculed in the city, and you know who it was. It was Jeremiah. Jeremiah must have thought, Lord, you told me to prophesy judgment. You told me, but, but look what has happened here. Look at this. Our enemies ran away. You told me, Lord, that the city would be burned. The Chaldeans are gone. The crisis is over. Was it in my mind that I heard you? Did I, was I thinking that's what you said? Have you ever taken a step of faith and what you thought God had told you didn't seem to happen right away? And You know what that took? It took more faith. It took more faith. Suddenly, the, the Bible says, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, Jeremiah again, again. He was told to go to King Zedekiah and prophesy that the Chaldeans would turn around and they would come back and finish the job. Oh, boy, I'm sure Jeremiah's thinking, whoo no, Lord, not again. I'm not doing that again. Look what happened the first time. Who will believe me now? Isn't that what you would think? More than likely, that's what you would say. But he went to the king's courtyard and he cried out to Zedekiah, the Chaldeans are coming back. They're going to burn down Jerusalem. Now, I think that Zedekiah, King Zedekiah, he probably looked at Jeremiah and shook his head. Man, what is your problem? Because he'd heard it all before. He'd heard Jeremiah say it. Now the Chaldeans have gone. This is not going to happen. So he turned Jeremiah off and went back to merrymaking and partying with everybody else. But not much later, a scout came up with the news that the Chaldeans are coming back. And the siege continued. And this time, the Chaldeans did not leave until Jerusalem was destroyed. Zedekiah, he summons Jeremiah again, this time in secret. And he said, is there a word from the Lord? In other words, he's saying now, I really want to know what the Lord is saying this time. Again, in desperation, he's desperate. He wants to hear from God. I want to assure you that the Lord does have a word for you today. He has a word for you. And the question is, do you really want to hear what he has to say? It does us no good. Listen, please. It does us no good at all to hear what God says if we are not willing to obey it. It does us no good. Jeremiah answered Zedekiah, yes, there is a word. You're going to be captured by the king of Babylon. That's what he told him. But Zedekiah still would not believe it or receive it. He only hardened his heart. He hardened himself because it wasn't what he wanted to hear. He wanted to hear that he was going to get away, that somehow he was going to be saved, that somehow 
Jerusalem was not going to be burned. He wanted to hear good news and good news only. God doesn't always tell us what we want to hear. In fact, many times he tells us what we don't want to hear. It's a noble thing for you and I to say, I want to hear from God. But that may mean nothing that we have to do. We have to do what we don't like. To surrender is not what Zedekiah wanted to do, and yet that's what Jeremiah said that God told him to do. God says, Surrender. Give up. Eventually, conditions in the city got worse and worse and worse. There was nothing left. The end was sight in sight. The king called on Jeremiah one more time, and he brought the prophet into his chambers through a private entrance. In fact, Jeremiah 38, 14, it's a little bit advanced in front of us, it says, then King Zedekiah sent for Jeremiah the prophet and had him brought to the third entrance to the temple of the Lord. Sneaking him in, right? He's sneaking him into the... He says, I'm going to ask you something. The king said to Jeremiah, do not hide anything from me. In other words, he's saying to Jeremiah, he said, give me the hard words. Give me the truth. Don't smooth things over. Tell me exactly what's going to happen. I really want to hear what the God is telling me this time. That's what he's saying. Jeremiah told the king to surrender again to the Chaldeans, that he, if he surrendered, that he and his family and the people would live. In fact, he says, if you surrender, even the city would be spared. That's what God told King Zedekiah, surrender, and you'll be saved, and your family, and the city. But if you don't surrender, guess what? It's all going to be destroyed. Your family, you, you're going to die. Surrender. Guess what Zedekiah did? He refused to obey the word from God. He was afraid of being made fun of by his officials. And to be honest with you, his pride got in his way. You can imagine to surrender how shameful a thing that would be. To surrender means you give up. You're weak. That's what God was telling him to do. All he had to do was obey the word of God. But because it was a hard word and not what he wanted to hear, he actually refused to obey God. And of course, God's prophecy came true. Zedekiah ended up trying to escape in the middle of the night He and his group were captured, his whole family. His sons were killed before his very eyes. His wives were ravaged. And his eyes were burned out in their sockets, all because of his pride. He could have have surrendered. But you see, not obeying God's word will not only affect you, but your whole family. That's what happened to Zedekiah. Because he didn't obey God, his family suffered greatly. (coughs) Excuse me. And not just his family, but the whole nation, the whole city, because their king would not obey God, that, that whole city was destroyed. What a terrible thought. To think that because I won't obey what God's saying to me that something terrible may happen to my family. Those that I love, those that are with me, those that are close to me. Simply because I 
refused to obey God. Disobedience to God not only affects us as individuals, but it affects those around us, even our families at times. I can't stand it when somebody tells me, my sin is my sin, and nobody else is bothered by it, and that whatever I want to do, it's a personal thing, and my sin, so you don't tell me what to do. It's my sin is my sin. They don't realize that sin, my sin, affects those who love me and those that I love and those that are around me. This is a clear uh, case where this, this man's pride, his sin, affected everybody. You see, we, we better get ourselves and our pride out of the way and obey God. God wants to give us a word. We need to be willing, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> to obey God no matter what people say, no matter what people think, we must be willing to obey God. We can't afford to miss heaven, and who else are we going to affect by our sin? We can't afford to miss what God is saying to us. It could affect us as well as our family, those around us. Number three is insincerity. Insincere. Many cry out and clamor for God's word, but it's a cover-up because they have sin in their heart. Many say they want to hear God speak, yet multitudes will not listen when the truth is brought forth. They will reject any message that touches their sin or their idols. All they're doing is saying, I look good if I say, hey, I want to hear God's word. I want to study God's word. I want to know God's word. Listen, if that's from the heart and it's real, great. But how many people say that and they're not sincere? They just want you to think they are. How clearly this is illustrated later in Jeremiah 42. You can turn over there and read it for yourself. Only a remnant was left and Johanan was now the leader. And they decided to run to Egypt. So they camped out at Bethlehem and called on Jeremiah to try to get a good word from the Lord. So Jeremiah shut himself in with just God for 10 days. That's the way Jeremiah would hear from God is he would go away from people, be by himself. He did it for 10 days, and the Lord answered him. You know what God told him? Jeremiah, they're lying to you. They don't want my word. They're full of idolatry. They just say they want the truth, but they already have made up their minds, and they're going to do their own thing no matter what I say. Jeremiah came to them with God's word. Because they didn't like what God had to say, the leaders accused Jeremiah of speaking falsely. And just as God had told Jeremiah, they decided to go their own way, even though God told them, don't do it. They did it anyway. God knew their hearts. He knew they didn't really want to hear from him. And it's the same with us. No matter what we say, God knows the truth. God knows. So in conclusion, I ask you, do you really want to hear what God is saying to you today? That's the question. Do you really want to hear? Because I know God wants to speak to you. Now listen, it may not be what you want to hear. God doesn't tell you just the good things he tells you all. It might, in fact, it may be a harsh, a hard word. It may require us to make some changes in our lives. Changes that we're not willing to do. But in order to be ready for his coming, because Jesus is coming, and to receive all God has for us in the meantime, we need to hear what God is saying to us. Do you believe that Jesus is coming back? Don't you want to hear what he has for us right now? Max Lucado, he wrote something that I think is a wonderful statement. I wish I came up with this word. 
He says, if there are a thousand steps between us and God, he will take every one of them except for one. He will leave that final step for us to take. He'll take 999 steps out of that thousand. But we have to take the one, and the choice is ours. We make a choice whether to take that one step or not. You do. I do. That step is for us to turn to God, and by doing so, we turn away from the things of this world. That's the step we must take. It's only one step. God will do all the rest. But we have to take that step.